Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we've got um, my couple of program notes, really. Um, first of all, um, my talk is based upon the models I've made. Um, it's got a little bit out of hand now. It started at six or eight, but it's now, I'm now into 19 and I've really got to stop. But um, two, I've got two, uh, um, an apology, first of all, uh, to Meza Me on the other side of the channel. They're not very well represented here, and that is unforgivable because you will know that for the greater part of the war, the French held the line and were the biggest air force and in fact kept our air industry going with aero engines which we were not in a position to manufacture. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a look at that. Um, right, Rob, thank you. I thought, I thought first of all it would be interesting to, to look at the parallels between the First and the Second World War to see what the, the, ad, the advance of aviation was. You all know this, the Gladiator, frontline defence in the West Country during the Battle of Britain. Uh, 257 miles an hour, uh, an aircraft that the First World War boys would have recognised, but obviously not its speed, which is almost double that that was available at the time. Then we go to the uh, end of uh, the Second World War, the ME163, which you all know of, 600 miles an hour, quite an advance. But uh, when you look at that, that's a factor of two and a half, OK? Um, the next one, we go, let's uh, draw a parallel with the First World War. This is the Bristol box kite. 40 miles an hour with the following wind, uh, probably stationary if not. We will go to uh, uh, the, one of the aircraft that I've got here that is 130 miles an hour at the SPAD 12 or the SPAD 13. Uh, that is then, I consider, is a factor of three and a half. So I think aviation moved much more quickly in the First World War than it ever did in the Second. Right, um, at the turn, we go back to the turn of, um, the turn of 1900, and well, you will know that um, the British Navy was the most powerful force in the world. We needed uh, to keep the sea lanes open for the empire, uh, and that navy was built on hundreds of years of experience and knowledge and usage. And we can look at people like Drake and Raleigh and Nelson. Uh, and then we go into uh, the, the army. If we go into the army about the, the same time of the turn of the century, uh, we had a minuscule force, the BEF, that went out to France. Probably 100,000, 100, 120,000 comp compared with the millions that the French and the Germans were putting in the force. Man for man, they were the equal of any on the ground, but they were a small force. And that experience was built up, again, through empire wars and, and usage. When we come to matters of the air, of course, things were quite different. Um, there was no history. There was, there was, we look at uh, the rights. There's a right uh, flyer over there, which you might be interested in seeing. That's the last one I've made. In the uh, beginning, at the turn of the century, there was um, the balloon section of the Royal Engineers, which then morphed into the Air Battalion of the Royal Engineers, which then became, in 1912, May 1912, became uh, the Royal Flying Corps. And that was established with 16 aircraft and three airships. The uh, British were mostly French engines because we were not manufacturing engines at that time. Although I note that Rolls-Royce was uh, offered a contract to build aero engines, which they turned down because they didn't want the development costs and they didn't want to build the, the, the few hundreds that were in, uh, in demand. So throughout the war, the French were really hard pressed to su supply our air industry with air aero engines, which have a specific large power, lightweight, which we were not able to produce. So you'll notice that in the models, most of these aircraft are powered by French engines until much later in the war. The Royal Flying Corps was looked on with mixed feelings by uh, the Admiralty and the War Office. Uh, they didn't really understand what aviation was about. 
those that flew were called adventurers, the unconventional, the idle rich, which had some substance because it cost £75 to train to be a pilot in 1912, money which was returned to you as and when you passed. Uh, the pleasure seekers, and uh, they were indisciplined, which they probably were. Not only that, they were badly dressed. And uh, the culminating thing, of course, the aircraft frightened the cavalry horses, which was really bad news. Um, many men were transferred from the army into the new exciting corps, uh, and those the service release papers usually marked unsatisfactory if you were moving into the Royal Flying Corps. And they were asked, why do you want to join, and uh, did you ride? And that was a criteria for flying, because uh, in those days you needed a good seat, uh, an ability for quick thinking and a sense of balance. Um, tuition. The beginners were told aerodynamics, not aerobatics. Um, we had dual control. Can we hop a two on, Rob, please? Next one. We had dual control. This is typical dual control. You usually get, you usually get um, a couple of flights Pilot in front, pupil at the back, as in this, and then the reverse operated, and the, the pupil sat in front, guided by the pilot at the back. And then one particular conversation is noted by an air officer that said, right, toddle off, do a couple of circuits, try not to break anything. I've got an ambulance standing by just in case. That's very good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The Navy at the time was asked what its requirements for aircraft was, and they replied, two. So no great enthusiasm for the Navy. They were to change, of course. The attitude of the Army to this new Flying Corps was, a general said, if I should want to see what the enemy is doing, I should ride to the top of the nearest hill and view from there. Sounds logical, doesn't it? Even the German general staff in September 1914 said, experience has shown that a real combat in the air, such as journalists and romancers have described, should be considered a myth. The duty of the aviator is to see, not to fight. General Foch, a useless and expensive fad, worthless as an instrument in war. I think most of that's changed now. <coughs> Right, at the beginning, in 1912, the military authorities uh, organised a flying event at Larkhill on Salisbury Plain. It was open to all manufacturers, and I use manufacturers in the loosest sense. They were about producing a handful of aircraft. People like de Havilland's, Avro, Hawker, Vickers, Bristol and Shorts were, were producing a number of small aircraft, but not... As, as, as a mass production item. And people that were used to fabricate were furniture makers, motor vehicle uh, operators, carriage builders, agricultural and boat builders. These were the people that were building timber aircraft in those days. At the end of, uh, the, end of the event, the flying event, it was uh, stated that there would be a cash prize, and uh, the aircraft which actually was successful would be built in numbers for the newly formed Royal Flying Corps. And flying, from, uh, flying as an adjudicator was Captain Murray Sota, a name we should remember, who was director of the Royal Aircraft Factory. Now, the Royal Aircraft Factory is another byproduct of my talk that I mustn't get too involved in because you could spend hours talking about that. It only operated between 1912 and 1918 when it was taken over by the Royal Aircraft Establishment. But um, the, uh, we have to be very careful to evaluate what the, the uh, Royal Aircraft Factory was about. And it states its aim as to evaluate, test, advise, and to make freely available uh, any findings made to all the small 
manufacturing capabilities. It was not per se uh, a manufacturing mass of aircraft, although it had the capability to do so. Now, there was uh, Charles Gray at the time, uh, was the editor of the Flight magazine, a, a new um, magazine, and uh, he had some flying experience. And throughout the war, he, was, he carried on a vindictive campaign against the Royal Aircraft Factory because his argument was, we have a government body which is actually manufacturing aircraft which will then pass into the Royal Flying Corps against the small manufacturers. Uh, not quite w what the, the underlying facts were, but you could understand him. And he had a, a companion in Noel Pemberton Billing, who was an MP, who would stand up in, in, uh, in, uh, in Parliament and rent about this huge disparity of the Royal Aircraft Factory. Um, at Larkhill, we had uh, about up to 100 entrants, but only 24 actually managed to fly to Larkhill to, to compete. There were four military monoplanes uh, made by the Royal Aircraft Factory, uh, and monoplanes, again, form an essential part of tonight's talk, Four air monoplanes entered, two crashed, killing the four occupants. The third also crashed, but the two occupants survived, and the authorities banned the fourth one from flying. <laughs> and from thereafter, it seems monoplanes were a dead hand. Nobody wanted monoplanes. They just were not safe. And yet, ironically, you'll see a bit later, monoplanes were at the forefront of almost every new innovation. The margin between safe flying and stalling, of course, in those days was exceedingly narrow. Uh, methods of control were practiced but not really understood. Maneuvers were attempted by guesswork, uh, repeating something that hadn't res resulted in a disaster. There was no manufacturing industry as such. Aircraft were built to be inherently stable. They were never intended for combat and it was difficult to make an aircraft do anything other than stay on an even keel. Um, the winner of the event uh, was one Samuel Cody. This is Samuel Cody's winning entrant. Uh, he won £5,000, which in 1912 must have been an enormous sum of money. But uh, sensibly, the uh, military authorities decided that Although uh, he won the prize, the aircraft in which Murray Sota was, arrived at Larkhill, built by the Royal Aircraft Factory, was in fact BE-2. This is the BE-2. We've got a model of the BE-2, which I will hopefully pass around. They are quite fragile. If you Please don't attempt to turn them upside down. They will just fly the once, if they do. <laughs> if, you could, if you could move them in sequence till they arrive back at the table, John. Thank you. I think I've likened the BE2 to the Ford Model T in the motor industry. It was the first that set the standard for everything else. You will recognise it as a conventional two-bay biplane, covered body, pilot and co-pilot seated in tandem, conventional tail, wheels and overriders at the front. Co uh, contrast that between that and, and, and Cody's, uh, another Cody, I mustn't get into Cody because C Cody was an American who came over at the turn of the century. He was a, a rough rider, uh, a millionaire. He got involved in everything, uh, film work, and, and he got into aviation knowing absolutely nothing about it, but passionate about aircraft. And he came over here, and he really was the godfather of, of air, aircraft in this country. He built his own, and the Cody aircraft you saw there was he built his own, uh, with, with a little help and plenty of his own money. But that's Cody. Right, so the BE-2 uh, arrived on the scene. 
and because it was built by the uh, Royal Aircraft Factory and Murray Soter was a judge, it was, it was deemed inadvisable to enter it in the competition of flying. So while Cody won, this aircraft actually took the event by storm. It was, it was bigger, it was much faster, it stayed up for an indeterminate time, it was easily handleable, and Geoffrey de Havilland, the man who designed and flew it, um, took people up for, for rides. And uh, at the end of the meeting, the Air Ministry decided wisely that they would adopt the BE-2 for, uh, as, as a basis for the, the coming Royal Flying Corps. It, it's 35 feet span, 70 horsepower Renault engine, French. It could manage 70 miles an hour. Uh, we, we, the one you have there is the BE-2A. There was a B, a C, a D, E, and an F, and by that time, of course, it became almost unrecognisable. It could carry small bombs, there were 3,500 built during the war, and obviously we get the two first aerial VCs, uh, or first VC with Rhodes Morehouse, who bombed the uh, train sheds in Courtrai in April 1915. Right, in August 1914, the, the RFC went to the Downs at Dover. There was one fatality getting across country for the takeoff, but. Amazingly, they all got across quite safely. 64 aircraft made it across from the Downs to Amiens Racecourse. Uh, the first to land was one Lieutenant Harvey Kelly, who will be an illuminary in the, in the Great War. Uh, the route was planned from coastal area to coastal area and across to Amiens, but he decided he didn't want to bother with that, so he drew a straight line in the map, went straight across and landed much to the disgust of everybody else, about a quarter of an hour before anyone else. So Harvey Kelly lasted until um, April 1917, when unfortunately he was killed. He was also the first person to down an enemy aircraft during the war. Uh, th he and three colleagues caught a German over the British lines. None of them had armament, of course, at that time. It wasn't thought of. They forced him down. Uh, he, he abandoned his machine and ran off into some woods. So they landed next to the aircraft and set fire to it. That was the first, of, if you can call that being shot down, that was the first official destroying of a, of a German aircraft in the Great War. The Royal Naval Air Service, another byproduct that I mustn't get too involved in, uh, was formed in July 1914. The Admiralty decided that they didn't want to get involved with all this military nonsense. They would do their own thing. So the, the uh, Royal Naval Air Service was really basically about home defence. And when the uh, BEF went out to France, the Royal Flying Corps went out in bulk and the Royal Naval Air Service stayed at home. It had all the coastal stations and what I call marine aircraft at the time, which suited it fine. Just a little note before we leave the BE-2. A Major Moore wrote about the BE-2. The beauty of these machines that once you were up to your cruising height, you could adjust a spring, which would hold your elevator in the position you wanted for level flying, and ignore the violent uh, bumps that threw up one wingtip and then the other. Held by the spring, you could fly hands off because the machine would write itself whatever position you got it into. We used to try it when well up to see if there was any position we could put them into from where they would not write themselves if left alone. If you pulled them up vertically and hung momentarily on the propellers and let go everything, they would tail slide gently and the machine gained flying speed and everything would be normal again. Major Brackner, not an experienced pilot, would climb to 2,000 feet, setting course, was able to make a 40 mile journey through enemy territory without placing his hands on the controls until he landed. He spent his time writing a report on the countryside below, ignoring the bumps and gusts. Um, just a, an, another little snatch about the Royal Naval Air Service, which is my favourite. Late in 1914, a young Royal Naval Air Service sub-lieutenant was called to the office of the Director of Air Services, Major now, Murray Sota, 
to be told that he was, and I quote, the defence of Britain in the air. Asked how he was to perform his duties uh, with a B-2 underpowered against the Zeppelins who could maintain twice his height. Um, there was no early warning system to say when and where they were coming. Uh, his limit was 10,000 feet in three quarters of an hour. Uh, he had a limited endurance. He couldn't fly at night and critically had no armament. To all of which Murray Soto said, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> That's how we went to war. The Germans had the largest numbers at the outbreak of war, 246, uh, and they had enormous manufacturing potential. The French were numerically weaker, 160, but they had good term, long, uh, long term potential, especially in engines. The British, you'll not be surprised to hear, were in the worst situation. We had poor manufacturing facilities, 113 machines that were all outdated, and we had to rely almost exclusively on French engines who were hard pushed to supply their own industry. This is Harvey Kelly. He started this, going over with the BEF to France. He started from Montrose in Scotland and flew to Whitby. This is near Whitby. Uh, he came into field for a rest, uh, and uh, you can see the, the, the pick's not very good here, but you can see him actually laying against the haystack there, smoking a cigarette. No health and safety there, you notice. <laughs> uh, another, there's another one, I think, Rob, of uh, B2. Uh, that is Geoffrey de Havilland in one of the earlier, earlier types. Things got serious when uh, a young Frenchman called Roland Garros decided that... Um, he didn't like all this waving and shotgun business. He tried to organise it a bit better. So he had a Moraine L, which we shall see shortly. There, I have got a model, um, which he fitted uh, a forward-firing Hotchkiss machine gun. And to prevent the propeller from being shot off, he, de he designed some deflector plates on the two uh, blades of the aircraft. And... Uh, in three weeks, he'd shot down five German air, very surprised German aircraft who were expecting waves and the rest. This is Jean Navarre, actually. He was a, um, another French ace. That's another one showing the, the Hotchkiss with the deflector planes on the blades. He was uh, flying uh, a Moraine L. Again, I've got a model of that there somewhere. Um, this, um, this didn't last long when suddenly the Germans uh, captured uh, Garros, he landed behind their lines and uh, his uh, machine was sent to uh, Anthony Fokker. Uh, Fokker, another boy. <laughs> Fokker was a Dutchman who uh, had somewhat of an aero engineer and man manufacturing his own aircraft and uh, before the war he offered his services to France who said uh, they weren't interested and he actually came to Britain and offered his services over here, to which they said no. Big mistake. Uh, Fokker then went to Germany and they set him up with, with his own establishment and, uh, and factory and uh, away he went. And he had a look at uh, Garros's machine and he thought, well, I can probably do better than this. And him and his uh, engineer decided to have a, uh, a long rod with a cam at the end, which operated on the rotation of the propeller against the trigger of the machine gun. That's the Fokker Eindecker. It's not a particularly brilliant machine. It wasn't faster than anything else, but what it did have, it had a fully forward uh, synchronized firing machine gun. Um, span 31 feet, quite a small aircraft, 100 horsepower Oberursel engine, 83 miles an hour, and of course, during this period, we had what was called the Fokker Scourge because the Fokkers held the sway throughout the Western Front with this particular aircraft. Fortunately, the Germans didn't use them as they should have done, i.e. concentrating all their resources at one spot. They put them in penny packets along the front line where they caused a certain amount of havoc, but it, it was repairable. Um, so for six months, they 
had the air war to themselves. This is Oswald Bolger, the only man I could call, I suppose, a, a good German in the First World War. He was head of, uh, head of air services and he was lost tragically uh, in a flying accident during the war with one of his companions. Suddenly the poor old BE-2 was being hammered. They were sending aircraft up and losing them in droves to the Eindecker. So the answer was to fit the uh, observer come uh, co-pilot with a machine gun in the front cockpit. Now what the pilot thought about this and the area of, the area of fire, you can see how limited it was. Um, suddenly the BE-2 needed 12 other aircraft to protect it when it's on its mission over the, over the, the French countryside. Uh, this is another, not a position to be envied, I would suspect, when you're doing 70 miles an hour and someone also firing back at you. That's the FE2. This is even worse. It gets worse. Um, we've, got, we've got a bloke firing over the top wing to cover himself from the back. He's also got a Lewis on a mount at the front there. And the pilot has got, also got a, a Lewis f firing, apparently, between his legs. I don't know. But uh, uh, this was... This, this was purely defensive, you can understand. This is part of the accoutrements that uh, an observer used to have. Can you imagine carrying that huge thing about with probably half a dozen boxes of glass slides that you had to manoeuvre and get some results from? Right, the DH-2. You have got a DH-2. Um, this was Britain's answer to the Fokker Eindecker. Then for a while we had parity, at least we had a forward firing aircraft, although uh, a, a pusher aircraft is never quite as efficient aerodynamically as a tractor, so it, but, it, but it operated quite well for a while. It had a um, quite small 28 foot wingspan, 100 horsepower Gnome French engine, 93 miles an hour, uh, and it was our first, what one could call, a single-seat fighter. But it did overcome the threat of the Eindeckers. There were 450 made, and there were two VCs in DH-2s, that's uh, Lano Hawker and Lionel Reese. Uh, there's another DH-2, quite a good shot of it. That one is a replica, but it's, it's pretty good. There's one or two details that are not quite, you know, who am I to criticise, but yeah, OK. Right, we then come to, uh, the, I suppose somewhere along the line, it must have been Tommy Sopwith, decided that if a monoplane can fly quite adequately and a biplane is better, then let, let's go one further and try three wings. So the triplane was a con completely different concept altogether. Um, once they started to come off the production line in numbers, they were offered uh, to uh, the Royal Flying Corps in France but at that time, they were being offered SPAD-7 aircraft by the French. So they said, no, we don't want your triplanes. They're, we don't know what their capabilities are. We'll stick with the French. So the triplane was exclusively a Royal Naval Air Service operative in Britain. Um, having said that, of course, it was to change. 26-foot uh, span, again, a, quite a small aircraft, 130 horsepower Clerget French engine. 113 miles an hour, we're moving up now. <coughs> but it was, it was it, phenomenally diff different aircraft than anything else. It could turn in its own uh, space, it could climb, as they say, like a witch. And uh, it still wasn't outclassed when the Sopwith Camel came into uh, production. The uh, Royal Naval Air Service um, had some real notables in them. Uh, a group of Canadians. Inevitably, they seem to, the Canadians and the Dominion forces seem to spread their wings during both wars. Um, Raymond Collishaw, uh, VC, was the third highest British ace. When, at the battles of the Somme, when we were really hard pushed for aircraft, uh, we appealed to the Royal Naval Air Service and they sent out a group of triplanes, which caused havoc with the Germans for the few months they were there. And we, they were all um, with had black noses, they were all flown by Canadians of the Royal Naval Air Service and as I say, Collishaw was the leader and the aircraft were 
Black Mariah, which was Collishaw's, Black Sheep, Black Death, Black Roger, Black Prince. And Collishaw went on to much greater things in the Second World War. He held high rank, and I believe he came uh, in, in, he was in charge of the Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. Okay, Rob? Uh, this is Albert Ball. I don't really want to deal too long with the personalities, but you will know them anyway. VC, DSO, two bars, MC, 44 victories. Born in Nottingham, uh, joined the Sherwood Foresters and transferred to the Royal Flying Corps in January 1916. He was what they call the first popular hero. Uh, the powers that be didn't like uh, heroes being adulated in the press. It wasn't, wasn't the done thing. But they're very difficult to stop news of what Ball's activities coming back into this country. And uh, he was considered only an average pilot when he flew two-seaters. Uh, he was a bit of a loner and he was a shy and sensitive lad. And he wrote to his mother, I only scrap because it's my duty. Uh, eventually, he was given permission to fly on solo missions. Uh, and then he moved into... SE5s, which he didn't like very much, uh, but uh, he, he had most of his successes on an SE5. Uh, he, was down, he was claimed by uh, Richthofen, I think it was Lothar, not uh, Manfred, uh, and he had a posthumous VC, and he died age 20. Right, now, th this man, I'll spend a little time on, on this next man because he is... Uh, one of the, the great heroes, the French heroes, fortunately, of, of the war. This is the uh, Newport 17, which was one of the best French aircraft of the war. Uh, it's, the, the particular markings are one of Charles Eugène Jules Marie Nungesser. Um, Nungesser reads like... Um, I don't know, I, I, I say action man, I suppose, because he was, Nungesser was into it, but everything. If you read his life story, it's, it's almost impossible. Uh, as a young man, he, he got into boxing and was almost a professional. He went to Argentina, this is before the war, as an auto mechanic. He became a professional racing driver. He learned to fly out in uh, Argentina, and then he got mixed up in some dodgy... Argentine government agency deal and he had to make it back very quickly to France as the war started. He enlisted in the Hussars initially and then uh, he made a name for himself by he used to go behind German lines and lay in wait for whatever was to come along and uh, he did that with some colleagues one day and they captured a German staff car and they killed all the occupants and drove the car back over French lines, so he was awarded the Medal of Militaire for that. He decided to transfer to the air service, and he was a natural flyer, he passed the first time. And in July 1915, he shot down his first aircraft, awarded the Croix de Guerre, and uh, he's, he, he got to be well known by the Germans, and they actually dropped a note on his aerodrome to say, would he like to come over and give single combat to their particular ace over there. And the lad said, no, you, you shouldn't go because it's, it's an obvious trap. He said, oh, no, 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 I've got to go. It's, it's a challenge. You can't dodge a challenge like that. So he went over and five German albatrosses jumped him uh, and he managed to shoot down two where the other three left the scene and went back to base. Um, while he was convalescent, he was injured almost constantly. In fact, I think most of his service life he was injured and convalescing. Uh, while he was convalescing, he borrowed an aircraft, went up and shot down another German aircraft, uh, and then he had put under house arrest for flying without permission. By now he'd got to 21 kills. Uh, he disliked discipline and uh, he had just had an appetite for danger. Uh, fast cars, wine, loose women, and sometimes on morning patrol, he would turn up from the local uh, establishment with a, in a tuxedo with a woman on his arm. He had a bad crash in February 1916 when he broke both legs. Um, so he got his mechanics to carry him to the aircraft while his legs were, were settling down. 
Uh, he was wounded again in May, he was wounded again in June, but he was still scoring and knocking down Germans. In 1917, he returned to hospital for more treatment, uh, and in, in, by August 1917, he'd scored 30 victories. In December, he had a bad car crash. He killed the passengers in his car, and then he had appeared as an instructor. And in August 1940, at the end of the war, he'd scored 43 victories. After the war, they made a list of his injuries, which, if you'll bear with me, skull fracture, brain concussion, multiple internal injuries, five fractures of the upper jaw, two fractures of the lower jaw, anti-aircraft shrapnel embedded in right arm, dislocation of left and right knees, bullet wound in mouth, bullet wound in ear, atrophy of tendons in the left leg, atrophy of muscles in the calf, dislocated clavicle, dislocated wrist, dislocated right angle, loss of teeth and contusions too numerous to mention. This, this is non gezer uh, Légion d'honneur, Croix de Guerre and 28 palms. Medal Militaire, Croix de Guerre Belgium, Distinguished Service Cross, Croix de Guerre Portugal, Russian Cross and the Serbian Cross. I think the next pick, you can actually, some, there are some facial scars there, so he's, he's getting a build up of injuries there. Um, after the war, he did survive the war. After the war, um, there was a uh, film in my extreme youth that I did see in black and white. It was produced in 1923, before my time, but it was a current called Dawn Patrol, in which all the First World War aces involved themselves in action to film in the air. Uh, and he did most of the flying in that. There were a lot of casualties during that. Um, in May 1927, he was back in France and he decided to make uh, the Atlantic crossing. At that time, it had never been done. I mean, Alcock and Brown uh, in 1919 made it, but uh, in 1917, there'd never been a solo flight across the Atlantic. So he decided to build his own aircraft, which he did, uh, called the White Bird, and he uh, managed to get a, a colleague to fly with him. Uh, they were last seen flying west over the coast of Ireland towards America. There is some evidence to produce that he did actually manage to crash land, but they don't know where. So um, that was the end of Nungesa. Um, two weeks later, Lindbergh crossed as a solo <coughs> crossing. Now the next aircraft is the most, probably the most contentious one, if we can find it, it's there. It's the most contentious one that we have tonight. The poor old BE2 was now getting hammered mercifully, and uh, they decided that they needed to replace it with something more adequate. And they replaced it with the RE8, same skull as the others. Now, the, the RE8, or the Harry Tate as it was called, um, inspired more loathing than any other aircraft during the First World War. There were a few pilots who liked it. But uh, it, 42 feet wide, 150 horsepower Royal uh, Aircraft Factory engine now, 102 miles an hour. It was built to be a re direct replacement for the BE-2. It was bigger, faster, and it was better armed. But it was a purely defensive aircraft, and it was widely used on bombing and reconnaissance, and they hung everything in sight on the RE-8. It did night patrols, it did ground attack, and uh, the four, over 4,000 uh, were being produced. And it lasted throughout, you'll not be surprised, almost to the end of the war, although it was a completely inadequate aircraft. This is uh, not a very good shot. The original shot is quite good, actually. But you can see on this we've got, let's, let's say we've got two heavily built men in leather flying gear, boots, helmets, and all the rest of it. We've got a Lewis at the back, for the, for, the co for the gunner. We've got the pilot who can also bring down a Lewis on, oh, that's the Foster Mount actually, uh, on, on a slide rail. We then have got, if you see barely in front there, we've got a Vickers as well on the front up there. Now when you analyse 
the drums of ammunition that these two, uh, these two uh, uh, Lewis's need, plus the belts that the Vickers need, plus the pilots. And now underneath, we've got 20 pound bombs, uh, probably six or eight of those. So when this thing gets into the air, agility is not a word you can use for it. There are some official comments to those that flew. An ugly, perverse aircraft that was generally hated by pilots who deliberately cracked them up to go back to obsolete aircraft. It embodied practically every major body design fault which had already been identified and for which the cure was known. The too small fin area at the back, the undercarriage was too far back so it used to nose into the ground. Petrol tank being up front next to the engine, uh, suddenly you were incinerated. It had bad visibility from the big air scoop at the front so the pilot could see very little anyway. And there were official notes for guidance on new pilots. The chief thing to remember is that the machine gives very little indicating of losing speed until it suddenly shows an uncontrollable tendency to dive. At 65 miles an hour or below, when gliding, the machine suddenly loses speed. Observers must be cautious about gliding down from over the lines. They must not stand up to look over the pilot's shoulder as the extra head resistance may cause the aircraft to fall below its critical gliding speed. Although there were, there were, mixed, there were mixed receptions to the RE-8. 59 Squadron, newly equipped in 1917, sent six RE-8s out to photo the drocourt quion line. None returned. Uh, ten, aircrew, uh, ten aircraft were, were, crew were killed. And it was called two things, the spinning incinerator and the flaming coffin. And it was kept in service to the end of the war, you'll not be surprised to know. <laughs> the RE-8 was unpopular among pilots of the Royal Flying Corps. Aerodynamically, it was a hideous creature and it enjoyed an evil reputation for killing pupils under instruction. But from the point of view of defensive aerial fighting, it was a marked improvement on the old BE-2, as all of us well know who tried fighting in the old birdcage. Uh, another, two, just a quick, uh, th this is the for and against the, the, the RE-8s. Two RE-8s were attacked by six Albatross scouts in December 1917. Although hard pressed, one RE pilot, Lieutenant Sandy, shot down an Albatross, which made a forced landing in the Australian lines. Another RE-8 pilot, Lieutenant Jones, joined Sandy and his observer Hughes until a third RE-8 approached and the Germans made off. Jones thought Sandy's aircraft seemed to be flying normally, so he returned to base. Next day, 3 Squadron received a telegram saying Sandy and Hughes' wrecked aircraft had been found near St. Paul. Examination showed that a bullet had passed through Hughes and lodged in the pilot's skull. The aircraft had empty fuel tanks and had simply flown itself in a wide circle until it ran out of fuel. Though, uh, Sandys was awarded the MC and Hughes the DMC. And conversely, uh, uh, another victim of the RE8 was Lieutenant Max Muller, one of Bolker's leading aces with 38 victories. He conducted a lecture to show student pilots about the best method of downing RE8s. Next day, he took off with six other albatross to put his theories into practice. Near Passchendaele, his group spotted an RE8 and Muller led his aircraft into an attack. The experienced RE8 pilot turned for home and put in a good burst at the leading aircraft, Muller. <laughs> It veered away and burst into flames, and a thousand feet lower, Muller decided to jump to his death. His companions duly made for home. So there, there's mixed things about them. This is part of Richthofen's wall. Actually, one of those plates is from Hawker's aircraft.
SE5, which you will probably know better than most. Again, we have a model. Um, not a very big air, a 26 foot wingspan, 200 horsepower Wolsey engine, 120 miles an hour. We're moving up now. Uh, they were introduced in March 1917 uh, and they were in operating according until the end of the war. 2,700 were made and it, I suppose it shared with the Camel the most aircraft destroyed during the war. Ball didn't like it, he called it a rotten machine, he preferred the Newport 17. Uh, in, but uh, in bloody April um, 1917, 912 British aircrew lost their life and the life of a new pilot was reckoned to be 17 days, albeit there were still hordes of young men coming forward to, to fill the ranks. Uh, Mick Manock, um, again, you know, a man that you probably know as much as I do about, VC DSO 2 bars MCM bar. <coughs> his father was an English corporal uh, and his mother, we suspect, was Irish, and there's a lot of question marks over that. His father was a bad drinker, and he abandoned his family when Manic was 10. He had a defect in his left eye, um, which lots of colleagues say didn't affect him in the least. In fact, he was better with his one eye than most of them were, were, were with two. Um, before the war in uh, July, he went out to Turkey as a telephone engineer, uh, being manic, he was stroppy and decided to cause problems wherever he was, and they interned him. Uh, he was in bad health, and uh, uh, they didn't really want the problem with him, so they repatriated him in 1915, another bad move, uh, and he joined the Royal Army Medical Corps. Uh, he wasn't a youngster by now, he's in his early 30s, and in 1916 he was an officer in the Royal Engineers and then he transferred uh, to the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, one or two quotes from Manic, which is typical Irish sentiment. He loved the crown, he hated Germany, and he believed that one day the Labour Party would bring heaven down to earth. The sun never sets on the British Empire because God didn't trust it in the dark. <laughs> He, was a, he wasn't a particularly good pilot early on. In fact, he was terrified of flying. And his colleagues uh, assumed he had a certain amount of streak of cowardice because he took a very long time to get into proper combat. Uh, his, as I say, his bad eyesight belied uh, that of the, those with too good eyes. Um, but he overcame his terror through sheer persistence and he had a fanatical hatred of the Germans. In July, he was uh, shot down uh, and he, 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 his total was 50. He always carried a pistol with him because he, although he was an advocate of parachutes, again, if, if we have time, I'll do an addenda on parachutes, uh, he always carried a pistol to dispatch himself. Uh, we're not sure whether he actually used that, but uh, he fell between the lines and there was a scramble between both sides to uh, us to reclaim his body and the Germans to obliterate the site with, uh, with artillery. Posthumous VC, um, and he did actually get four in one day. And he became um, a sort of older statesman to the young pilots. It's said that he never actually lost a young pilot when taking them out on patrols. He did all the hard work and said, you watch and, and, and see what's going on. Any sign of trouble, go for home. And he very rarely lost any, any crew members. The Sotwith Camel. Uh, we all know about the Sotwith Camel. 30 foot wingspan, 130 pounds, another French engine, 130 horsepower Clerget, 113 miles an hour, introduced in May 1917. It destroyed most enemy aircraft during the First World War. Um, the, it was a pig to fly, apparently, to young pilots because uh, the torque in the engine, one taking off, threw it violently to the right and you had to take off and crab to the left. Uh, once in the air, it was fine because you could do right hand turns on the button and turn around. Uh, but it, they, were, they say that there were more deaths in training on camels than there were actually fatalities in the air. Uh, 4,400 produced uh, and the uh, Royal Naval Air Service also flew them.
Right, Albatross D5. The Albatross D5 was something new. The Germans obviously were good on technology and the First World War was very much technology based and where one aircraft uh, dominated, the others eventually managed to superimpose that. But th this was uh, obviously a, a, a nice looking aircraft. It was multicoloured, the model will show you that when I can find it. Um, it had 29 foot wingspan, 185 horsepower Mercedes engine, 116 miles an hour, we're moving up now. Uh, and it was flown by people you would know, Rick Toven and Goring flew this. Um, I think it's a, a moment to mention the, the difference in attitude between, just in our case, the, the British and French. The Germans um, uh, liked the adulation of their pilots. They were very, all very high, people made a success in the air, they made a very high profile, uh, people like Richthofen would have extended leaves and he would tour the provinces and he would be fated. Um, and their, their aircraft actually followed that lead. They were encouraged to multicolour them. They wanted them to be seen over the Western Front and they wanted the British to know who they were fighting at what particular time. So aircraft colouring, uh, I think Gore at one time had an all black aircraft, but you know that they they were very high profile aircraft. Now, um, the British on the other hand took the exactly opposing view. All theirs, until perhaps the exception at the end of the war, were really drab colours. Um, they, you must remember that the, the, the German Air Force was a body in itself. The Royal Flying Corps, as its name suggested, was a part of the army. It was a uh, it was an adjunct, it was an assist to what was happening on the ground. And as such, they were not interested in losses. They were having losses, multiple, magnificent, horrible losses on the ground at the Somme. Why shouldn't they have the same in the air? It didn't really matter. So uh, the aircraft were tended to be drab and, and inconspicuous. And uh, the same thing applies to uh, British pilots that started having successes. The authorities didn't like notables and heroes going round. Their argument, and you can understand it, was who is the hero? Someone like Ball at 20, who can uh, have his own billet, have a, a rousting evening with the lads, go into the local estaminets, go into town, run into Paris, uh, living a dangerous life, but a high life one. Uh, and then you, you contrast two young men who are going up in a BE-2, who are flying day after day over enemy territory, knowing that their chances of coming back are very slim. Who are the heroes here? So they tended to average out every pilot in the same way. There were no heroes. So and, until Ball came along, and it was embarrassing to keep him in the, in the shadows. But uh, this is why the Germans had high profile. And remembering at the time that they were fighting over territory they occupied. And another e factor to remember is their um, uh, uh, scores, like Richthofen's, are 80. Most of those, almost all of those, were corroborated because he had the opportunity to get into a staff car, go to where the aircraft had crashed, pull a piece off and stick it in his study. They, they were credited with those aircraft uh, in, in that way. Whereas the British were quite different. They were flying over occupied territory. Their losses were falling into enemy territory, very difficult to credit. And there were three ways that you could credit an aircraft. One, if a, com uh, if a comrade with you saw the aircraft hit the ground uh, while you were shooting, that would be credited to you. you, you, could, you it could be confirmed. Two, uh, if... Uh, uh, the, the people on the ground, uh, which is most unlikely, uh, because a lot of these aircraft fell between the lines, if the people on the ground confirmed it, the artillery or roving uh, you know, infantrymen credited that aircraft and plotted it, you could also claim that. Also, you could also claim an aircraft if you managed to recover a part of it. 
Now, the chance of that for a British pilot going out into no man's land, stripping a bit off a, a, a foreign aircraft, would, would nil. So you can see that the people like Manock scored 70 odd, but he actually claimed about 140. Now, even if you put a very small percentage of those back into his total, which he must have scored, he must have been well over Richthofen at the time. But because of the way they used to calculate their losses, uh, you, the German ones are verified. The British were always much understated. Now, the Germ when the Germans uh, met the, uh, the uh, Sopwith triplane, it was suddenly a bit of a shock. There was an aircraft that were actually outperforming everything they'd got. And uh, it took them about a year. And th this is designed by Reinhold Platz, an, uh, one of Fokker's chief engineers. And he'd never actually seen a British, they'd never had a captured uh, evidence of a, a, a Sopwith triplane. He'd never seen one, he didn't know what the performance was, and he built a triplane exactly uh, as, the, as he would uh, from the drawing board. He wasn't even convinced that it would work. But this is the, 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 the uh, Fokker DR1, uh, which you will know as a, well, you will recognise it as a Richthofen uh, model. Although Richthofen, of course, flew almost every other mark. It's a fallacy to say Richthofen always flew uh, triplanes. He didn't. He flew whatever was available. If an aircraft was disabled, he moved on to something else. He flew uh, Fokker uh, D7s as well, which, again, we shall see in a moment. <coughs> But again, once the DR arrived on the scene, our triplanes had gone, and they started to cut sway again through our poor old RE8s were again suffering like mad. Uh, 110 horsepower, the Rhone engine, strangely enough, uh, before the war, uh, there were a lot of French engines in Holland and Belgium, and the Germans uh, accommodated these and introduced them into their aircraft. 102 miles an hour. Um, Richthofen, we know, was killed in an all-red uh, triplane. Now, this, this, I'll spend a few, a few moments on René Paul Fonck. He was the top Allied fighter race. He had 75 victories. Again, he claimed 142. If you even add half a dozen into that, which were almost certain, he would certainly have, have beaten uh, Richthofen. Um, Legion d'honneur, Medal Militaire, Croix de Guerre, Military Cross, Military Medal, Belt, we can go on. He was conscripted as an engineer. He had pilot training in 1915, and he was one of these eggheads who, um, he believed in mathematical principles and, and engineering, and he approached flying in very much uh, in, that, in that way. Uh, and what he did is, he was one of those people who practiced deflection shooting. Now, if you're, if you're flying at 100 miles an hour, an aircraft that's also flying at 100 miles an hour, possibly in another direction, to actually strike those uh, at the right time and the right angle and at the right speed is very difficult. But this man managed it to unbelievable. In fact, some of the claims he made were disbelieved until they were proved to be right. Um, he, uh, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a particularly pleasant man. Uh, his comrades didn't like him. He was a bit aloof. He was a bit of a braggart. And the annoying thing about his, his being a braggart was most of his claims were actually true, which, which made it even worse. Um, uh, he, there was one occasion where uh, he and two American pilots in his squadron decided that whoever was first up that day and went out and, and, and shot down a German aircraft would be a winner of a bottle of champagne. So Fonk said, right, let's do that. Fonk was rather late up, and one of the Americans went out and shot down a German aircraft, which annoyed Fonk intensely because he wasn't a man that was, wanted to be second to anything. So what he said, no, I know what we'll do. We'll, re we'll rehearse the challenge, and we'll say, whoever shoots down the most today will win the bottle of champagne. Right, so... Uh, he went out at four o'clock in the afternoon. The weather wasn't very good. He went out at four, four o'clock in the afternoon, and by 4.05, he shot down three German aircraft. <laughs> Two hours later, he went out again when the weather abated, and he shot down another three aircraft. So that was six in a day. Now, it's the first time anyone's ever six in a day. 
Uh, if you go look through the records now, there are, there are a number of claims for six in a day. There are Canadians and people like that, but they probably shot down observation. But this bloke used to shoot down fighters as well, and he, he allowed nothing to chance. It's said that during the whole of his career, he only ever had one bullet hole in the rear of his machine. And he was never wounded, he was never shot down. And in one instance, uh, they had a, a, a particularly contentious issue. He'd shot down three aircraft and he used to reload and rebelt his, his, his machines himself. He wouldn't let the engineers touch it. But they took, they took his gun to pieces and they found out, they, they confirmed the three aircraft, where they were all shot down within the time and space, he said. He confirmed that and, he, and he'd used 17 rounds. Now, 17 rounds distributed between three aircraft, if you're looking at 500 rounds a minute, five, 600 rounds a minute, what sort of expenditure is that? A fraction of a second. And that's the way he used to put them down. And he, he said, uh, have I got a little quote from him? Yeah, or he said, I put my hands on the back of the pilot and that's where the bullets go. And it's as easy as that. Um, he, uh, he, he frequently got involved in double dog fights. He, wa he wasn't a man to go mixing. He was a bit of a loner because the, his comrades weren't that, that fond of him. But they did, they did acknowledge that he was unbeatable in the air. He used to go out early morning and stalk and wait for someone that, that, that wasn't prepared. Um, he repeated the six in a day a little later during the war. Uh, and he ended the war, as I say, with 76 victories, 75 victories. <coughs> his uh, post-war, his after-war career was uh, somewhat blemished. It was a bit of a grey area. Uh, during the opening part of the, uh, the French uh, shutdown, when, when the Germans took over, um, he was involved with uh, Foch and Pétain in trying to get French pilots that had been captured back. And then he was labelled as a collaborator because he was uh, trading with the Germans. Uh, eventually, uh, after the war, that, that they, they did a, a quick study and found that in fact, he was a member of the resistance at the same time. So his, his record goes, eventually, it was unblemished. Um, he died at 59, and he's buried in his home village. But he was the supreme aerial fighter in the First World War. Now, this, this aircraft, which we need to see, uh, which is by, almost by both sides considered to be the best aircraft of the First World War, certainly nothing... Uh, Certainly nothing was, was uh, superior to it. It's the Fokker D7. Another one that Richthofen flew on occasions. Uh, all, the, all the markings on these aircraft are, are specific to a particular pilot. And I, I think, I'm not sure, I think this one Berthold, but he was another uh, top pilot. That's the Fokker D7. Again, you can see the noisy colouring. This is what they wanted. They wanted attention in the air. Uh, it was considered the best German fighter of the war. Um, Richthofen and, and Goring flew it. There were about a thousand built, and because the Allies thought so highly of it, it was part of the armistice reparations that they demanded that the Germans give all their Fokker D7s over to the armistice thing. This is the Bristol M1C. Um, a monoplane again, you notice. Now, um, they're, they're, as I said, be, during the war, there'd been a, a sort of moratorium on monoplanes. They just didn't like monoplanes. This one came up, and you, you could argue that this could have been the Spitfire of the First World War because it had everything. It, had a ter it was higher speed than anything else that was flying. It was, uh, re they, all the pilots really liked it. But the, on the, um, they had a senior officer carried out a flight test on it when it was first introduced. Uh, and it unfortunately he frightened himself with it uh, because it was, it was so skittish on the ground. It was very difficult to land. The only drawback they take with monoplanes was you need a very high speed landing and taking off. 
uh, whereas you could you total a BB2 down at 40, 50 miles an hour, you needed 70 and 80 to land this sort of thing. Uh, so um, there were only uh, a few used in this country, and the powers that be decided that as it was a monoplane, they needed a reason to move it on. So they, they all those that were built, uh, do we have how many? 125 were actually built during the Great War. They moved them out to the Near East, uh, where the conditions were so unsuitable for them, the sand and the hot weather, that they were a disaster out there, to which the authorities said, well, we told you so. We knew they were no good. That was a monoplane, wasn't it? I, th I thought the Royal Naval Air Service was a bit poorly represented, so uh, I got involved in this actually. Uh, it does have the one eight, the short one eight four. Didn't have a very glorious career, uh, but it does have two or three claims to first to the to fame. Um, it was first introduced in 1915 as a two seat reconnaissance bomber. It was the first aircraft ever to sink a ship with an aerial torpedo in the Dardanelles. First time ever. Uh, it was a uh, the first aircraft that had folded wings which could alight in the sea and be lifted off on a crane to what was an aircraft carrier, which is a transport with a shed on it. So again, a first there. Uh, and it was also the only aircraft that was operated at the Battle of Jutland. Now, there is a, 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 an incidence of the uh, 184 actually sighted the German fleet uh, at Jutland and radioed back, they had a radio transmitter, a one-way radio transmitter. They radioed back to Beatty, they'd found the German fleet and they gave its uh, direction and speed to Beatty. Uh, two things happened, either uh, that, that message wasn't received, which is unusual, or more likely Beatty chose to totally ignore it because it came from an aircraft. It was nothing to do with the Royal Navy, and he chose to ignore it. It was what might have been at the Battle of Jutland. And that's the claim to fame for the short 184. Um, 63 feet. It's got 260 Sunbeam engine on it, British. And if you go to the Royal Naval Air Service Museum at Yeovilton, you will find uh, the body of a 184 there. That's all they have. There are no ex you know, models, complete models. I'm tempted to go down there and offer them the model to sit beside the fuselage, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> um, really, I think we're I think we're into the last the last bits now. Uh, just one or two little bits that I can throw in. In 1914, the Royal Flying Corps had 146 men and officers. In 1918, they had 27,000 flying uh, officers, and they had a quarter of a million other ranks. That shows you the progress. Uh, and the aircraft, they had less than 100 in 1914, and they had 22,600 at the end of hostilities. The world's first aircraft manufacturing was Shorts, 1908. They started The first powered flight in Britain was by Sam Cody, Samuel Cody, the American, in 1908. The first Englishman uh, in a recognised flight was Moore Brabazon in May 1909. And the first to lose his life was the Honourable Charles Stuart Rolls in July 1910. Now really I've finished my discourse but I've, I've found in the uh, hope that someone would ask me about parachutes because that's another contentious issue. I've decided to do a little look up on parachutes. Right, in 1917, they were used by the Germans, the French and the Americans. I don't think it was uh, mandatory. I think they offered them to all those that wanted to use them. In fact, um, Ernst Udet in the Second World War, who got to be a uh, Luftwaffe chief, he actually ejected in 1918, although he, he broke his legs, he ejected in 1918 with a parachute. Um, but the British had their own reasons not to like parachutes, and here is the official reason. It is the opinion of the Air Board that the presence of such an apparatus 
might impair the fighting spirit of pilots and cause them to abandon machines which might otherwise be capable of returning to base for repair. What a despicable, a despicable thing, probably by air ministry people, not by those in inactive. Uh, it, it has to be agreed that at that stage they were very bulky. Uh, they obviously limited the performance of the aircraft and they were very heavy as well. It's almost like a third crew member. So there, there, were, there were reasons for that. Um, interesting little addenda to that as well. In March 1918, sorry, in March 1917, the Russians asked um, for a hundred parachutes to test. And then we sent an official note to them, again, which makes interesting reading. As it is the opinion of the Royal and Military Flying Services that this device has little chance of being used in aeroplanes, it was decided in the first instance to inquire for what purpose the Russian government required parachutes? <laughs> now, what, what could you say to that? Uh, in the end, they sent them 20 out of their 100. 